Oh, yes, they want to know. When you and I met in 1965, it was because you were big news. You were the first non-beauty contest winner. Not that there's anything wrong with it. I beg but, your pardon. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, you were the That's first professional. just because I hadn't won a Britain, you know, I'm laughing at you. You I were a professional know. journalist yeah. and the very first yes. female professional journalist on the Today Show. That's there true. had been absolutely no others. Now, how did you get the nerve or the idea or the dream? None of the above. Um, First of all, I cannot believe that we have known each other that long. Isn't that nice? It is. And we've both gone through so much <laughs> together. It's very nice to be with you. Yes. It really is. No, okay. it really 1965. is. 1965. Right. Uh, I didn't have the dream and I didn't have the nerve. What happened was that I was working on the Today Show as a writer. And in those days, even before I was on the air, they had one female writer out of something like seven. And the only way you could get the job is if that female writer got married or died. Uh, or the best thing to do is to get married and then die, because then there'd be no possibility. You <laughs> see. And they would then hire one other female writer who would do the female pieces, the fashion shows, the, the celebrity interviews, the, what I call the tea-pouring interviews. So I did that. Uh, and I was thrilled, thrilled, because I had worked in television before. Every show I worked on went off the air. I'd been in public relations for a while. I hated it. So now mm -hmm. I was writing, and I was the, quote, today reporter. I went off and did stories. You were the first Playboy Bunny. I did a Playboy Bunny story, as a matter of fact. I did the day in the life of a nun, not exactly the same as the Playboy Bunny, but we had variety. <laughs> and then what happened was that um, every, quote, today girl had been a model an actress, some kind of a performer, and um, very good, as a matter of fact. And that's what they looked for. And the last one was um, Maureen, o Maureen O'Sullivan, the mother of Mia Farrell, right? I have it right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An actress. And she just couldn't cut it because they made the same mistake we make very often, and that is someone wonderful being interviewed can also do an interview. And so they had to let her go. And they had to pay off her contract, and they had to put someone on the air. So they put me on for 13 weeks, and I stayed on for 13 years. So it's not as if I said, as I've sometimes said, what about me? What about, I never thought it was going to be me. I was too serious. I didn't speak that well. I was from Boston. I didn't pronounce my R's. Uh, I wasn't beautiful. I was... What, pert? You know, um, but it, I never thought it would happen. The last two years of my contract, the then host was a man named Frank McGee, and he died of cancer. Nobody expected this to happen because he was a young man. And when he did, NBC said, we're looking for another host. And my agent, because we didn't even have agents in those days, this was someone very new, said in my contract, co-host. Well, he wasn't going to die, he wasn't going to leave, who was going to be a co-host? But it happened. And so two years before I left, I was named co-host, doing the same job. And from then on, every woman on a morning show, and on most shows, but certainly on the network morning shows, is co-host. Um, I'm very proud of that. I think that's a so a lovely legacy. What did you envision yourself doing as a career? Did you think of yourself as a journalist before the Today Show? When I graduated from college, I went to Sarah Lawrence College, where everybody seemed to know exactly um, what she, because it was an all-girls college then, was going to do. And I liked children. I thought I would teach. And then you had to go on for a master's to teach in the New York City schools. And I didn't feel like continuing school. And my father was in show business. My father was very well known at the time. He ran, owned and ran and did the shows for big nightclubs, very famous, called the Latin Quarter. He was an entrepreneur. So I had all of these contacts. And when I got out of college, I went to speed writing school. I was number one in my class in speed writing. And I can still do it. 
that is the success of my career, that and the fact that I don't very often have to go to the bathroom. Those are the two reasons for my, and I don't sweat. Those are the three reasons for my success. I'm being facetious, yeah. but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> and I worked for a while in public relations and here and there. And then I started in the publicity department of the local station at NBC because I had the contacts. So I didn't have this great vision, but then I realized that I could write, and I could write for television. I could write the way I talked. And then the rest, a little mm -hmm. by little, I began to work um, so in television as a writer. Did you have any role models, or was no, this all no improvised models. as no. you went? No, today you would have been my role model, but you and I were contemporaries, so no. Um, there were a couple of women on television. There was Pauline Fredericks, who was was the United Nations correspondent, but as time went on, they used her sparingly. She was so smart, but they never used her full time. Because to age was not acceptable. To age was not acceptable, and she wasn't beautiful. Um, uh, there were very few. So our Walter Cronkites. There were no Walter Cronkites. It were nipped in the bud because it wasn't it, a, a no, allowable to age. No, no, and the Today Show at that time was the only morning show. Um, and it was still a male-dominated show for many years on, on the Today Show. I did the tea-pouring uh, ch chores. And as a writer, my big breakthrough was when I was allowed to write for the men. Not to appear in the air, just to write for the men. When Hugh Downs came on as the host of the Today Show, um, I wrote the introduction to him. I wrote uh, many of his questions, most of his questions. For years, I sat in my little cubicle with one of the male writers and wrote, as writers do today, the interviews, the questions, and so on. And when I went on the air, the big thing for me was I could write my own questions. And when we began to do film reports, I could edit. I'm a good editor, that's what I do best. I, you know, the beginning, the middle, the end. The middle's not so important. Uh, beginning's very important, end is very important. Those were the qualities I had, not, not my looks or my great personality, I don't think, but uh, I could do those things. No woman had done them. But the biggest thing that happened was when Hugh Downs left the program, a newsman named Frank McGee came in. He was very unhappy doing the Today Show. He thought it was beneath him that she, he should have been doing the news at night. And he never really liked working with me, although on camera he was okay. Now how did that manifest itself, well, that he didn't like working with you? How I did you know you, that? Ah, because the major interviews were the interviews, the hot, quote, hard news interviews were pretty much as they do today coming out of Washington. And he wanted to do them by himself. This girl sitting next to me shouldn't be able to do them. Well, I wanted to do some too. By that time, I was beyond the tea pouring. And I, I thought that I had something to offer, but I didn't usually fight for it. But it, at this I did. And he went to the president of the network and said, Barbara should not be allowed to come in on this interview until I have asked three questions. Does that not sound unheard of? <laughs> and the president of the network agreed with him. And so, when we did these interviews, after three questions were asked, I could come in. And this is when I began to do interviews outside of the studio. I would film them. Because outside of the studio, they were mine. And this is when I got a good reputation of being a, a real journalist, but also the reputation of being a pushy cookie. Did you get people other people couldn't get even then? Yes, yes. because I, I would do what I've always done, I would write and tell them why they should do it, not why I wanted to do it, but why it would be good for them. I would phone. I would phone again. I would write again. I, I was very persistent. We didn't have bookers, so-called, in those days. We had the writers. And they didn't do that much. So, yes, I mean, I did, I think, the first uh, interview that Henry Kissinger did. That's a long time ago. 
uh, I can give you a lot of the first. And little by little, um, NBC began to recognize this when Richard Nixon went to China. I was sent there. I was one of the maybe, oh, I think I was the only network female journalist, although there were, uh, there were several others. And so uh, in time, my work became accepted. Now I'm getting ahead of mm -hmm. myself. But for many years, I could only write for men. Mm -hmm. They only do, I could only do female interviews. I mean, it's now as if we're talking about the Civil mm. War times. But the miracle then and now is still the same to me. When restrictions are so pervasive, where does the courage come from or even the idea to break through? Did you think about that or did it, I mean, where did the self-respect come for you to say, wait a minute, I should be able to interview the Washington uh, subjects too. Well, I don't want to put myself down, but I don't think I ever had your kind of courage. I think I loved what I did, and I thought the way to do it was to just work very hard, and it would be noticed. Um, I never, I did at that time, because I was so offended, go up to the president of the network, a man mm. named Julian Goodman. But for the most part, Gloria, I mm. just worked extra long. I worked extra hard. I did not make waves because but now, wait a I minute. might have drowned. That's, I don't know. Yeah, that's, I, I did the same thing, incidentally. So I'm, okay, you know, you well. may think, we each think the other one is courageous. Okay. All right. <laughs> But, Maybe we both were, who knows? But, but each of us was trying to be a good girl. Yes. If we just worked hard and right. were good girls, right. everything would be fine. Mm -hmm. But somewhere you got the courage to demand to go to the president of the network. Where did that come from? I don't know. As I think back on it now, because nobody's asked me that question, I think, I don't know. <laughs> Where did I? Why didn't? And, and when I was told that I couldn't come in until after the third question, well, today, I would have quit, but there was no other job to go to. Uh, and at that point, probably, I think at that stage, I was a single mother, more or less supporting my child. Um, I didn't say, how dare you? There was no human resources to go mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. I didn't call one of the newspapers and say, let me tell you about my hardship. You swallowed and came in in the fourth question. Well, tell me what else was going on, because, I mean, this... This has use in the future because women now and in the future need to confront restrictions. But where they may be different restrictions, but they, nonetheless they need the courage. So were there other things going on backstage? Was there, we all have our favorite sexual harassment story. Do you have a sexual harassment story? Um, there were people who had their girlfriends promoted we didn't do anything about that. Um, I have a sexual harassment story, but I just managed to avoid it. I didn't have the person. He was a very high executive. So how did you avoid it? I stayed out of his way. Um, it was so different because you had no support. There, there was no place to go and complain. Nobody would have cared if you'd complained. It probably would have been considered your fault. You know, so get out of his way, or get out of the studio, or get out of the... The men that I worked with on camera were wonderful men. I never had that problem. Well, I did with one, kind of, ah, oh, yes, the, <laughs> who would call me all the time, and mm -hmm. I just avoided it. Um, Hugh Downs was wonderful to me. I'd make that very clear. He was not the man. Mm -hmm. Joe Garagiola, these were the men I worked with most. And you just did the job, and you didn't. Complaint. Did you feel lonely as, as the one I, and only? No, because I ha always had uh, an outside life. I always had friends. My life, although my job was the most time consuming and the most competitive, and when I went to ABC, hugely competitive, and that's where, that's where I was my biggest failure. I was a co-anchor, the first female co-anchor of a network news program uh, with a man, Harry Reasoner, who couldn't accept me. Um, 
I, I was miserable. I was a failure. Um, and it was a very different and very difficult time. But on the years in the Today Show, it was just mm -hmm. a matter of working very hard, and I had a private life well, and a child. What happened when women at NBC began to organize? You must have felt, how did you feel about that? They hadn't organized until it was almost, you know, the, my last days. Women, in, you know, there were so few women in television. I'm so proud mm -hmm. of the number of women. We take it for granted now. But those, there were very those few. Those early women at NBC brought a lawsuit against NBC. That was quite late on. Quite late but on you were still at women. NBC when they brought the yeah, suit. I, if I was, then I was. Then I remember when they did bring it on. But by that point, I was almost. I had almost gone. I had almost left. So is that why you didn't join the suit? It was a suit that did not just have to do with women. It also had to do with discrimination. Yes. In a, Racial and race generation. and sex discrimination. Yeah, yeah. But you were asked to join it. You know, if you're bringing up something, I, I would not deny it, but I don't have any memory of it. It was almost when I left. It was almost around the time that I was leaving and I had other decisions that I was making. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly didn't oppose it. And it had much more to do with racial discrimination, as I remember, than it had to do with women being on the air. But I'm very foggy about it. No, it, it had to do with both. I think, if our research is accurate, but that I you, have not you, done the research. You so didn't I don't join remember. it, but you. Uh, I would when certainly it was, have supported it. You contributed it. some money toward it. Yes, I would certainly have supported it if I didn't join it itself. And I'm not being vague. I really mm. don't remember it that mm. much. End of my time there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Harry Reasoner is also the person who predicted that Ms. Magazine could not possibly last more than six issues because we'd said everything there was to say <laughs> in the first issue. You know, there was so much resentment against women. We'd moved ahead to that. This was 1976 when I came to ABC. Had I been a man, he would have resented it anyway, had I been Mike Wallace, because he wanted to do the show alone. But the idea that I was a woman and that I had started in television, and not the men's domain, the Associated Press, mm -hmm. and the United Press. And how to tell me a story, uh, uh, any incident, uh, of how that manifested in, your, in your daily work life. When I was, well, I had left the Today Show, where I had really, in the last years, been very happy. Uh, Frank McGee had gone, Jim Hawks was there, nice man. I was, I think, the stronger personality. I was doing the kinds of stories that I wanted to do, a Good Morning America had begun. It wasn't making very much of a dent. Uh, CBS Morning Show had at one point. My big rival was Sally Quinn, and they, who was a writer for the Washington Post, and they'd made a big noise about that, and it hadn't worked out. And um, I was very happy and, and fairly confident. And then came this offer to go to uh, ABC, and I fully understand why Katie Couric left. By the way, explain explain why you left, and also why? how that relates to Katie. Because it's similar, although the times are very different. Mm. I'd been doing the show for thirteen years, getting up at four o'clock in the morning. I was also doing another show that was very successful, called Not for Women Only, a syndicated show that had been put on by uh, the local station of NBC because of FCC. You had to do a certain number of news shows, and it took off, and they NBC. NBC began to syndicate it. Had I stayed with the syndication, who knows? I mean, I would have had hundreds of millions of dollars as a big syndicated show. So I was doing all of those shows. I had a young child, seven years old. I was pretty tired. I didn't think I was tired until I thought about it. Here was this new opportunity. They told me that the news was going to be an hour. They told me that I could do interviews. It, the, anything that I had wanted, and it could only go up. Well, that's not necessarily so. It can also go down. I was so lost and miserable when I came to ABC. When I think about it now, it's taken me years not to get tears in my eyes. Mm -hmm. I was so lonely. I would walk into that studio, and Harry would be sitting with the stagehands, and they'd all crack jokes and ignore me. What kind of jokes? Not dirty jokes. But uh, funny things. But related or what did you to do? your being a female. That, and that related to my having no part of it. The only time we could talk about anything was because I was a Yankee fan and I could talk about the game. Uh, no so one, it was like going into a locker room. No one would talk to me. The stagehands later, when I was working with, said how bad they felt, but nobody 
said so. There was not a woman on the staff, from the producer to the camera men to the everything, except my my longtime assistant and my makeup person. I used to sit in the dressing room and wipe the you know keep wiping them. They they keep powdering me and I keep wiping. And I remember because when, you were tearing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was so lonely, and mm -hmm. I was failing, and I read about it in every paper and magazine. Uh, one had a headline, you're a flop, and when I saw the person who who had written it, and I said, this is so painful, he said, well, you are a flop. <laughs> and it was everything about me. I then had to work my way back, and that was my salvation, but I'm getting ahead of the mm -hmm. story. It was the loneliest time. I was a failure. I had left a place where I had been happy. The newspapers hated me. The public hated me. How dare I even think I could do this to this nice house? Was this the million house. dollar problem too? I remember the resentment and the tension in the press because you got a million dollars a year. Well, it was huge. Now, at the same time, there were people doing syndicated shows like like Mike Douglas and who were getting tons more money. But the, when I left NBC, they were very nasty about it. Today, everybody says gives going away parties, but they were very nasty. And uh, at that point, I did have an agent, and I got five hundred thousand dollars a year for doing the news, which was what Harry was getting. He was probably getting more, and five hundred thousand dollars for doing four one-hour primetime specials, which I still do today. They were enormously successful. That was paid for by the entertainment department, quote entertainment department. So it wasn't that I was making a million dollars for the news, but nobody cared about that. I was the million dollar baby, and poor Harry Reasoner, who had worked, was not. And this added to the fact, the woman who came from the Today Show, who didn't have the solid news background, who had not had the credentials of the men, who had the nerve to even think that she could be an anchor. Well, I guess if we'd done research, we would have realized how much resentment there was. And the hour news, the affiliates wouldn't accept it, it turned into a half hour news. And the interviews that I did, the first night I interviewed Anwar Sadat, the second night I interviewed Golda Meir. Mm. How could I do interviews on the news? Look at today. Mm. I mean, everybody's trying to get on the news the big scoop, the big leader, the big interview. Uh, it, was, it was the most awful time. There were certain highlights. I got a telegram one day from a man I didn't know. I opened it up and it said, don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs> and it was signed, John Wayne. <laughs> That's and when, uh, and then I would get so many letters from women, Gloria. Yes, tell me about... Well, that were, was were the you, shining side. Were you getting, by this time, were there enough women either uh, in the it, audience or in well, the profession? Well, you don't have an audience. I don't think so much watching because ABC News was number three and it stayed number three. So it isn't as if we particularly lost viewers, we just didn't get any, except for the first night. Second night, David Brinkley and NBC said on his telecast, welcome back to the, to the audience. But the letters that I got were what saved me. If you can do it, we can do it. Mm -hmm. Hang in there. We're having the same problems. I hear it today. I hear it today. And I would sit in that dressing room and read hundreds of these letters. And when I went home at night, I would answer them, as, as many as I could. We didn't have computers, and we didn't have email. And then when Rue Knowledge, who had been in sports, became the head of ABC News, he made the decision that we had to, that Harry and I had to be split up. He made a whole new configuration in news. And he let Harry go back to CBS. He could have kept Harry. And he made the decision to bet on me. So really, he was choosing you. Yes, he did. Right. And this is when I worked my hardest and did probably the best interviews of my life. The joint interview with Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat when they, when, when uh, Anwar Sadat first went to Israel. I spent a great deal of time in the Middle East, very torn between my travels and my child, mm -hmm. very torn. I did a huge interview with Fidel Castro, spent weeks there. I mean, the most important interviews that I did, I did in those mm. years of little by little working my way back. Do you, do you think that the support of those letters from women played a role in your ability to hang in there until yes. that was possible? Yes. 
they meant so much to me because I realized it wasn't just me and my job and, and, and the discrimination against me because it was discrimination. It was discrimination within the studio and, and, and in the press. But the idea that women in all different fields, whether they were uh, just beginning an industry or whether they were lawyers where there was the glass you know, the glass ceiling. At that point, it wasn't glass, it was steel. Mm. Or in any aspect of their lives, they, were, they understood what I was going through when they were with me. It made an enormous difference, and it still does. When people come up to me now and say, um, I don't know, you, I, what, I'm sure they say to you every mm. day, Gloria, you made a difference. Or my mother says you made a difference. Or I wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for you. I mean... And there That's was, a reward, isn't it? Yes. And there was a little girl named Oprah who was watching you on television, as she has explained, with a notebook in your lap, understanding that she also could do that. Well, Oprah has said that she, when she was looking for jobs, and she didn't quite know how to present herself, that she would um, look at me, because I used to look down at my questions and up, and I would sit like this. And she copied me. Now, fortunately, she got the job. So I take full credit <laughs> for Oprah. There was also, in my early days on the air, Ba Wa 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 <laughs> on Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. You know. How did uh, that feel? Well, Gilda Radner did it. And, and she was wonderful. And she not only did the Ba Wa Wa Wa, which I hated because I do pretty much pronounce my R's, mm -hmm. but she sat like me. I mean, I don't know whether you can see this, but I used to sit with one leg tucked under the other and like this. Mm -hmm. And she said that she got it from my makeup artist who came from NBC and used to do me. She was my, thank goodness she was there because uh, I had somebody I could cling to. And she also did Gilda. So in the beginning, I really minded. I still do today when somebody, someone says there's Ba Wa Wa Wa, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> but I went into my daughter's room. At that point, Jackie was maybe 10. And she was up late watching it. And I came in to scold her. And I said, how can you watch this? And look what she's doing. And she said, oh, mommy, where's your sense of humor? <laughs> and that did it. And when I finally met Gilda, and what a loss that she's no longer with us, that wonderful humor. Um, I was then thrilled. I thought, what you know, what a great, <laughs> I don't know, what a great compliment. But did I like it? No, I did not like it. I have a theory that uh, women get more radical with age. Do you feel that you have experienced this in, in your life, that you're better able to fight for yourself now than you would have been mm. 30 or 40 years ago? Well, I think that all women are better able to fight for themselves. I think that the things I care about I care more deeply about. I had, at this advanced age, met somebody uh, whom I uh, had, had just met, and I thought, I don't even know whether I want to have another dinner with him. And I walked in the second time I saw him and said, I have to ask you two questions. The first one is, how do you feel about stem cell research? And if he said, I'm against it, I would have said, that's it, and walked out. <laughs> now, I'm not sure I would have done that years ago. I probably would have been so grateful that he was taking me to dinner. So that my convictions are much, much stronger. I don't care about success or competition uh, uh, the way I guess I used to. I'm not ambitious, so I don't feel that I have to. I don't know where that went, but it went. A different kind of feeling came in. Mm -hmm. um, a sense of time, a sense of what's been accomplished, a sense of pride in how much women have accomplished. So I don't have to fight so much. But if I did, I would. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in those days, it's very hard for young people to imagine what it was when if you had a problem or a fight, there was no one to go to. No one. You worked it out yourself. If you made a big scene, you'd get fired. So you didn't. What did you do? You made yourself irreplaceable. And you also created uh, vehicles for women, not for women only, The View. You Sorry. have brought all of these women onto television. Yes, I have. I'm not sure that I did that for the right reason. Not for Women Only became successful because we took a little syndicated show and did the most, at that time, uh, outrageous subjects. I was, because of the ratings, I was always doing sex. 
I knew more about male sex. I could tell you more about premature ejaculation than most doctors. <laughs> and so the program became very successful. And we, we took on big subjects that people hadn't done. Yes, but they were women taking them on. But they were women taking them on. It was a women panel and pretty much a woman audience. The view, I hadn't realized how different it was going to be. But it was I, the But view, it was. Four women. The view was your idea, was it not? The view was my idea. I didn't know anything about daytime television. It was a simple idea in supposedly a very bad time period that hadn't been making it. What was the idea? Four women of different generations and different personalities and different opinions sitting together and talking the way you and I would be if we were having a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And in its way, it was the first. So sometimes you stumble into things, but there have to have been something in your head, maybe, that made you stumble into it. If I'm going to take any credit, is that it was it was there somewhere because it wouldn't have happened otherwise. Well, it was your life experience. I guess. Having coffee okay. with women, yeah. getting letters Arguing, from women. talking, and liking each other. Liking each other, not women just competing, not women trying to outdo each other, but being able to have these kinds of discussions and arguments and liking each other. I think that was such an important lesson in The View, but it wasn't set up that way. I didn't say, I'm going to do a show and show that people are going to have different opinions and blah, 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 women. But it has, obviously, to have been mm -hmm. somewhere in my experience. This is one of the few places where people see friendship among women. Well, we've often talked about the chemistry, and the chemistry is another word for friendship, that we can even argue, as, as, and very vociferously, especially you know, about the Iraq War and about uh, George Bush and so on, and still walk away or still end the program friends. That's unusual. Uh, but you don't often see men just sitting and talking in the same way without being confrontational. You wouldn't see four guys sitting around discussing what was going on. That would still be today be considered sissy talk. This is uh, an impact of the women's movement. You are as much as anything on earth, the women's movement. No, you are. <laughs> <laughs> it has to, to be plural. It has well, to be plural, Barbara. It's not a movement. So, I mean, it's I all the of these things. Yes, it is. What do you think of when you think of the women's movement? I think that we have come so far, especially in communications, in everything. In, not enough. There's always not enough. But we have wonderful directors in films. They're not all just cutesy poos in front of a camera. We have women in every aspect of television. And yet, we still have so many of the s same stigmas. Women, we hear, uh, don't want to be like you and me who worked. They want to stay home with the children because it was too much stress um, working. And so now it's gone the whole other direction. I hope that isn't so. It's not so. Well, it's not, it has no statistical reality, no. And we are able more and more, even though it's always going to be tough, that balancing act. It is always going to be tough to have the, mm. the marriage, the career, not the job, the marriage, the career, the children. But with the help, one hopes, of the man in your life, maybe your husband, maybe not, you can have more of a balance mm. than we did when I was starting up. So you think that the women's movement uh, belief that yes, men can raise children as well as women can, and that the job patterns can change since they're changed in every other modern democracy in the world, they've changed. Well, you don't I, think that that, you think it's always going to have to be women? I think, it's, I think we still have a prejudice in this country about the man who stays home uh, and the man who, who prefers to bring up the children, and we see it much more, well, it, or, or, or whatever. Or but it's not an either or, no, it's that no, both parents that would both, be able to. But I'm to, talking about even mm, the ones who stay home. Mm, I mean, they really are, you know, what are you, what's wrong with you that, that you're with your child? The fact that both men and women want to be to care for the children, that's new, relatively new. But I'm not sure that the women's movement per se is, has the same significance to women that it did when we were, when there were so many barriers mm -hmm. against us. I'm not sure it's well, you in know, the forefront of people's thoughts. If you, if you look at the public opinion polls, it's much better. Maybe, but I don't yeah. hear about it as much as I did all the time when there were those barriers that you could see. Mm. Today, the barriers are, uh, are well, less what, seen. What, what, would you, what would you say are the barriers now? 
I still think that there are employers who are concerned about hiring the woman because she's going to have the baby. I still think the idea that the man calls in and says, I have to stay home today because little Johnny has the mumps, there's still a kind of, you do, there still is that sort of uh, domestic imbalance. I still think that, that industries, although it's changing, in which women are on the top and take executive positions uh, is still tough, but so much less than it was when, when you and I met in 1965. It is worlds away, and I, I don't want us to sit here and say, after you, Alphonse, but you did it, Gloria. Mm. You did it, and other women with more courage than I had. You did it by fighting. I did it perhaps by example. You did it also by example, but, but mine was what, I, and what it said in those letters, hang in there, if you can do it, maybe we can mm -hmm. too. Human beings are communal creatures. Young women or anybody who's having a hard time who may be watching this many years in the future probably will still need to know that they need support from others with similar experience. Well, you know, I have found, again, I'm generalizing, that women are enormously supportive of women in the issues that we care about. This doesn't mean that we don't compete for a story, but so do men. But I try to be very supportive of women because I know what I went through. And, and women do need that help. And it, it is still a little difficult for men to understand it. The fact that we're going through still the same kind of thing. The fact that we still have the same pull between the career and the child and the marriage. Yes, men do to a degree, but not the way women do. Catherine Hepburn, whom I interviewed several times, and she was that wonderful grouch, said, you know, you can't have it all, and, and I would never get married and have children, and I can do it in my sleep. What if I had an opening night and little Johnny or little Katie had the mumps? I'd want to kill them. I really would want to kill them. Well, you know, I said, you have to make the choice. Well, you damn well better make the choice. Well, you don't have to make the choice today, but it's still, it's still difficult. I always wanted to write you and say to you that it seemed to me that Peter Jennings didn't take you seriously. Peter Jennings always put me down. I had a very difficult time working mm -hmm. with Peter. Very difficult. And I miss him as a journalist, uh, but he never took me serious. Mm -hmm. Once in a while he said to me, that was a good report. Like, oh, what a surprise. Mm -hmm. And that's not that long ago. And I don't want to put Peter down. He was a superb reporter. And no, it's him. not. But, but it's he just... did. He put me down. I was not. But how, how? But it was also. How because, did it? How did it happen? What, what's well, an incident think, of it happening? I, there were right. times when I said I'll no longer work with him. He would interrupt. He would ask me a question. I would answer it, and he would sort of look away and go to the next question, uh, to without any regard for what I said. Uh, on the night of the bicentennial, when I was in Paris, because uh, we were all sent to different places, not a bad place to go. He made my life miserable before. Uh, it was one of the unhappiest. By doing what? You better understand this. You better understand the French, Re not the, the, the French student revolution. You better understand that. You don't know anything. You better learn it. You better, you know, it was, he was just very tough on me. We worked on program after program, and he would put me down, or, I mean, the audience mm -hmm. even noticed it. It was very So you did difficult. get letters. I did. I said, I won't go on. I couldn't. He was, he was too big a giant at that point. I said, I don't want to be in the next program with him. There were programs that I refused to go on with him. There were times when he got letters and he would send me emails and apologize mm -hmm. because he was like a big bully. I was used to working with bullies. When I stopped to think of it as we talk, he was the third bully that I'd worked with. Frank McGee, Harry Reason, Peter Jennings. Mm -hmm. But I also had enormous respect for him because he was such a wonderful journalist, and we did program, we covered um, weddings in, in uh, Great Britain, Princess Diana and Prince Charles, we covered um, funerals. I remember in the wedding of Prince Charles, there was, I said something about the flag in Buckingham Palace when it was used and not used, don't ask me now, I've done homework. And he said, you're wrong. I was right. But he never came back in the air later and said, you're right. I mean, and I look today and think, it was part of my philosophy, which was shut up and do your job. But here's the miracle, Barbara. I know you say this is very simple, shut up and do your job. But where does that strength come from? Maybe ambition. 
maybe survival. Maybe self-respect, maybe uh, you know, self-authority. Now I'm going to have to go home and say, now where did this come from? Um, I have the feeling your f father did, and, I, and perhaps your mother did too, respect your opinion. No, I don't think no? that. I don't it think didn't both, come love, from no, that? It didn't come from them. It, I did not have parents in those days. Who, I had loving parents, but who said you can do anything you want. Mm -hmm. What I did have was a father who was in show business and my fear that it could all be gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm and that I had to work. You and I have that for different reasons in common. I had to work. If the job was grubby, I could not say I'm going to leave it and get married because I wasn't very good at that and I didn't want to have that as my safety net. I had to work mm -hmm. and maybe somewhere Maybe that's it. Well, let me try another theory. Did your mother have dreams no. that she no. couldn't realize? No, not that I know. She had, she had. There were more serious problems in, in my family mm. than my mother having dreams that she couldn't make it. I didn't. I don't think in my mother's generation it occurred to her that she was going to have a career. Because some of us are living out the unlived lives of our mothers. I'm not. I am. I, I know. Mm. I'm not. It is very touching for me to sit here opposite you, and to to see how we've grown and to see that we are happy women. And maybe that says more than anything else about our lives, mm -hmm. that we're okay now. And I thank you. No, and I thank you. I remember was the one writing about you. Ah, you yes. were the <laughs> on-camera yeah. person that inspired me. Whatever it was, look at us today. <laughs>